Evolutionists have a problem. Through all of their weak just-so stories, they have no explanation for the human blood clotting cascade. First, initial trauma to tissue activates factor 7, which then activates factor 10, catalyzing fibrin from fibrinogen covering the wound initially, creating a basic clot. This is just the spark called the extrinsic pathway, which sets the intrinsic pathway in motion by activating factor 12, which then activates an enzyme called factor 11. Factor 11 activates factor 9, which then forms a complex with factor 8 to activate factor 10 again. From there, factor 10 converts prothrombin to thrombin, which then cleaves fibrinogen to fibrin. It's fibrin that creates the fibrous structures which trap platelets and forms a plug to trap blood within the vein. If any of these factors developing from different systems are missing from the overall system, the individual cannot form clots and suffers from thrombosis or hemophilia. The system itself could not exist without blood already present, and if blood is present without a clotting system, there is no way to prevent the organism from bleeding to death. There simply is no explanation for how all of these details just happen to fall in place one at a time, nor is it beneficial to have so many required steps involved when one of the main tenets of evolutionism is that each step must give the organism some sort of advantage. They expect us to take this seriously? I had to investigate. The actual clotting mechanism comes down to two specific enzymes, platelets and fibrin. When a tissue experiences trauma, individual cells are broken, exposing the collagen lattice supporting them. Platelets are chemically attracted to collagen and immediately attach themselves, undergoing a chemical change in the process and releasing several other granules which ultimately activates fibrin, a filamentous material which adheres to the wound allowing for more and more platelets and red blood cells to adhere to the site, effectively sealing the wound. The vertebrate clotting system, however, is not this simple. Instead of this basic mechanism, the vertebrate clotting system uses a cascade that can be compared to an elaborate Rube Goldberg machine, being an absurdly complex mechanism for completing a simple task. A major tenet of evolution and biology in general is that unnecessary drains on energy are selected against. Before even approaching a step-by-step -step process explaining how this cascade could appear, there must be some kind of benefit to the organism. This benefit stems from the concentrations of the factors in blood. Each factor is a catalyst, facilitating the activation of the next enzyme in the chain. In their normal state, they are inactive until they are catalyzed into their active state. Until that point, they freely circulate uneventfully throughout the bloodstream. Fibrinogen, which becomes fibrin, is present in blood at a concentration of 3,000 mg per milliliter. The thrombin which activates it is present at a concentration of 100 mg per milliliter. It is converted from prothrombin by factor 10, which is present at a concentration of 10 mg per milliliter. The further away from the actual clotting mechanism a factor is, the lower its concentration, as in the case of factor 9, which activates factor 10 and is present at a concentration of only 5 mg per milliliter. The effect of these increasing concentrations is amplification. Instead of a single enzyme taking on the burden of activating fibrin directly, it activates enzymes which in turn activate several other enzymes which in turn activate several other enzymes, and so on and so on. Although the clotting cascade doesn't initially form a clot like a more direct mechanism might, it ultimately produces millions of times the amount of fibrin, allowing the system to block far more blood flow. But it would not be necessary in the ancestors of vertebrates whose circulatory systems would be far less pressurized. When a cell is ruptured, its chemical insides spill out. Many of these internal chemicals cause contractions in the surrounding tissues. In the lowest pressure circulatory system, this is already enough to stop bleeding. But there are also cells in blood that serve purposes completely unrelated to clotting, and which happen to become sticky when they react with cellular chemicals. This is the clotting system present in starfish, sea urchins, and worms, and it works very well for them because their circulatory systems are very low pressure. Fibrinogen would be the next addition to the mix, although it is not the only enzyme capable of creating a lattice structure. Lobsters, for instance, use an enzyme called transglutaminase, which is so similar in form and function to fibrinogen that it is actually referred to as lobster fibrinogen. This chemical is already present in nearly 
nearly every living cell is vitellogenin, which allows for the growth of a yolk in eggs. When a lobster is injured, its own ruptured cells release their vitellogenin, beginning the initial seal, which then allows more transglutaminase in the lobster's blood to form an even larger clot. In 1990, Russell Doolittle and Marcia Riley published the results of an enzymatic and genetic analysis of vitellogenin in crustaceans. They discovered that the transglutaminase gene was a duplicate copy of the vitellogenin gene that had experienced subsequent mutations. This duplication allowed the original gene to continue specializing in developing yolks, while the new one was free to specialize in developing a clotting enzyme. Doolittle and Dafei Feng had already explored the clotting cascade in genetic and enzymatic detail and presented their results in the 1987 Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Virtually every enzyme in the cascade is a very specific class known as serine proteases, which serves the function of cleaving other enzymes and even themselves. The fact that each of these factors were serine proteases led Doolittle and Fang to examine the genes responsible for each of these factors to see if there was a genetic relationship between them, like transglutaminase and vitellogenin. They discovered that each of the factor proteases in the cascade were, indeed, modified copies of the prothrombin gene, showing only minor genetic variation. In 2008, after Russell Doolittle and Young Jiang conducted an analysis of pufferfish and sea squirts, they discovered that thrombin itself is a variant of an enzyme sea squirts also possess, originating from the same constituent genetic domains as the vertebrate factors. This enzyme does not serve the purpose of clotting in the sea squirt, but, as had been demonstrated in a laboratory experiment conducted by a team led by Fumio Shishikura in 1997, it does catalyze mammalian fibrinogen into fibrin. This confirms confirmed that all of the factors in the clotting cascade have their origins in already available enzymes. This leads to another prediction Russell Doolittle was able to make regarding the clotting cascade. If the clotting cascade developed step by step as our ancestors evolved, then we should expect to see incrementally more of the factors in the chain, or the genes expressing them, present in organisms as they are more and more closely related to us reflecting the process of the clotting system evolving to adapt to our higher pressure circulatory system as it developed. In his continued mapping of vertebrate genes and clotting factors, Doolittle uncovered exactly that. In basal chordates such as sea squirts, the clotting system is simply the adhesion of cells to the ruptured area. In basal vertebrates like hagfish and lampreys, two duplications express factors 7 and 10, catalyzing thrombin and fibrin. Due to a block duplication of factors 7 and 10, all vertebrates with a jaw known as nathostomata, including sharks, amphibians, and mammals, also possess factors 8 and 9. Due to another duplication, nathostomes with four legs, including amphibians, reptiles, and us, have factor 12 and precalocrine. To finish the cascade, due to a duplication of the precalocrine gene within mammals, all marsupial and placental mammals, including us, possess factor 11. The exception to this homology, however, is in whales, which do not possess factor 12. This is precisely where the genes tell the story. In an April 1998 paper in the journal Thrombosis Research, a team led by Umeko Semba analyzed the genes of whales, humans, and cows to compare the genes corresponding to factor 12. They discovered that the genes for factor 12 were present in whales but truncated and rendered non-functional due to two mutations resulting in a frame shift which rendered the genes inactive. This shows that not only is factor 12 not necessary for the clotting cascade, but also that it is removable from organisms that have come to rely on it. Factor 12's expendable role in clotting was confirmed in the May 2014 issue of the journal Veterinary Pathology when a team led by Diane Bender examined the genes of several cats, showing that factor 12 was absent due to a single base deletion in exon 11 of the factor 12 gene, resulting in a premature truncation of the protein, and yet their clotting system works without any detectable problems. This had also been seen in several, but not all, breeds of dog. Birds also show a reduced production of factor 12, indicating that it may be in the process of atrophy. Even humans, on occasion, lack a factor 12 with no adverse effects. By any definition of irreducible complexity, the clotting cascade just does not fit the bill. It can, in fact, be reduced and still function. Each step along the way still serves the same function of amplifying the clotting process. More importantly, in living examples of the cascade, there is a correlation to the step-by-step -step development of the system corresponding directly to the genetic and phylogenic family tree. Rather than falsifying the theory, the clotting cascade is a fulfillment of many predictions made by the theory of common descent, and another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode.
In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.